thank you first of all for doing this. This is this is very nice to be able to get together with you. Well, it's a it's a pleasure actually to have a chance to visit uh, this way. Um, I'd like to start out by asking you uh, how you felt when you uh, you heard that you had been nominated to uh, receive the Order of Lincoln Medallion. Well, I was delighted because I know it's quite an honor. The Lincoln Academy is a, is well known in the in the state and. Uh, and then with the other laureates that were on uh, on the, the ticket, so to say, at the time, it was very interesting, very interesting. Well, you know at least one of them, uh, Jack Greenberg. Jack Greenberg, I know, yeah. yeah. He sends his best. We saw him this well, morning. Good, good. Um, let's begin with your early life. Where are you originally from? Grew up in Chicago, in South Shore area. Um, quite a while ago. city's changed a little since uh, I lived there. But... Uh, I did most of the things that other kids did at that point, I, although I, I was uh, fortunate. And I, I liked to work, and I start, and it really it was been a hobby, and I started caddying early on, uh, probably the age of 12, I guess. And uh, at that was at South Shore Country Club. And then from then on, I went to be the beach attendant and the, the starter, and I went all through college as a starter at the, on the first tee of the, at South Shore. So that was a lot of fun, fun along with the, uh, uh, along with the, with the work and a little money that came with it. Where did you go to college? Loyola University. Why yeah. am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about what, what time was that? Nineteen. 40, 40, that's okay. correct, 1940. Okay. Yeah. What, what did you study at Loyola? I was a philosophy major, believe it or not. I uh, really intended to go into law, and that is a, is a basic curriculum for, for uh, a law degree. And then the war came along, and uh, I never did get back to uh, finished the degree, my degree in philosophy, but never did get back to law school, which has been just fine. Yeah. What was the, uh, what was the, uh, um, I wouldn't say the culture of Loyola like, but what was the Loyola experience like in those days and the values it imparted to you? In the liberal arts curriculum and in all the curricula at, at uh, uh, Loyola, they're strong on, on ethics, they're strong on values. Uh, they had, of course, the uh, accounting department and things like that. It was a different kind of value, but uh, uh, the liberal arts curriculum was languages and Latin and, and ethics and a lot of that kind of philosophy. Uh, and it was a, a good preparation for time to come, I think, for the later experience in life that I had. You said the war interrupted your studies as it did millions of uh, yes, in your yeah, age. Yeah. What, what, uh, where did you end up? Went to the Navy, uh, had to f go into the Navy to finish uh, school. And from there, getting a degree, two weeks later I was at uh, Columbia uh, as in what they call a 90-day wonder, wonder in midshipman school. And then from then on went out to uh, the Pacific uh, on a destroyer. And uh, uh, that was about it until 1940, when was the war? 1946, I believe. Visiting with my uncle last week in North Carolina, he was on. Uh, he was helping run amphibious ships up to the beach in places like Iwo Jima. Tough duty. Oh, it was awful. Tough yeah. duty. Yeah. Um, but uh, after after the war, uh, you didn't resume your education. As I no, I had finished uh, a school, and I had I went back into the business that I started in going through school, as booking orchestras and and uh, acts and kind of producing shows. In, around the city, and uh, I did that for a couple of years, maybe a little more than a, a couple of years, but I, I know I was getting out of the business just as Nancy and I were, were uh, going together, and uh, so that, must, that was about 1947, so I did it for a couple of years. That was an interesting part of my life, yeah. Who were some of the acts you brought? Well, it was primarily orchestras, and then, of course, uh, and 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 good ones, uh, Claude Thornhill and and, uh, uh, and Count Basie and some of those from time to time, the big ones. But most of them were for smaller orchestras, lesser known orchestras. I would say smaller. Um, and for 
proms and parties and dances, and then to produce shows, what we call club dates. You're probably familiar with club dates. It's somebody wants a, uh, some entertainment at a dinner, you, know, you, you put it together. And that's what I did. It was interesting. Good business to be out of, though, for me. What put you on the path to your work with American National Band? After I got out of the entertainment business, I went to work for a glass manufacturing company packaging business. And uh, then through one or two iterations of that packaging business, I ended up with uh, American National, with National Can, then it became American National Can. And that was a, a wonderful experience. About what time was that? It started with National Can about 1961. Sort of a snapshot of what the company did? Oh, packaging. yes. Uh, we had 14 plants. We're doing about $85 million worth of business. It was a rather small company then. And uh, it grew. And we ended up with, as American National, uh, about $4.5 billion with 120 plants throughout the, the world. So it was an exciting time. And a lot of fun. You must have been going up the ranks through. I came on as a, a, a sales manager, vice president of sales, and then executive vice president, then se senior vice president, then executive vice president, and then uh, president, then chief executive officer, and then chairman. When did you retire? Not that you appear to be retired at all. Well, <laughs> I, I believe I, I should know that date. I think 1987. 87, 88. I stayed on as chairman of the executive committee until two years ago. Now, what you just sketched out was a tremendous amount of growth from $85 million a year up to, to what you just mentioned. What were the key factors in that growth? Hard work and a good team and some innovation. Uh, we really developed the, what they call the pop-top beverage can. Uh, we were the first ones in the market with it, and that led to some success, obviously, because everybody wanted it. We couldn't produce enough, which was a nice, a nice feeling for, uh, not for long, six months or so. Then we developed a, the two-piece can that you have now, uh, everyone takes it for granted, but there used to be three pieces, a top and a bottom and a, and a body. We developed a two-piece can and ran with it. It was a better product, simpler product, not as many variables when you don't have a seam and you have, you know. So we took that and, and grew significantly with it as the soft drink business was growing in cans. It was it's simultaneous. Soft drinks were originally in three-piece, and we'd move them into two-piece, and so the industry was growing as we were able to grow. Then we took it overseas. We were the first ones overseas uh, with the two-piece can, and that uh, stimulated a lot of growth for us. As you, as you worked in that environment and, and went up the, uh, uh, the corporate ladder, um, what were the values that guided you along the way? And and the ones that you wanted to make sure that were the hallmark of your business, the underpinnings of the way you were doing business with your suppliers and, and your customers? Well, the hallmark was really service and quality, and obviously price had to be as good as, as low or as good as anybody else's. But the other side of it was dependability and responsiveness. Our group of executives they would respond, you know, night and day. If somebody needed something, we would be there. And that was one of the things that, that uh, I just had great respect for them because they all responded that way. Everybody was customer, whatever they wanted. If they were in an emergency, they'd get taken care of. Uh, and I think the, that and integrity, I think the integrity of an organization is, is so important. And it it shows, it shows in 
many ways how the company develops and it shows in your organization from the top down. You, you've spoken uh, at, uh, at great length about this. I know in talking uh, and hearing your remarks at the Lincoln Academy and I know that there's a, a Frank Considine Chair in Ethics and Applied mm -hmm. Ethics mm -hmm. in Loyola. Mm -hmm. um, with what we're seeing today, um, what, is your, what is your advice to today's executives and those on the way up to avoid the, the problems we're seeing right now? The advice I would give is just remember that integrity is the hallmark of character and quality individually and corporately. And executives know when they're going over the edge. They try to be creative. I understand being creative. That, that's, I think that's one of the priceless ingredients if it's properly used, being creative. But don't do it in such a way as you're attempting to deceive the public. Some of these situations, just out and out, misrepresentation. And from an integrity point of view, uh, that's a serious flaw, in, in my opinion. As you, as you watch the uh, events of uh, the last few weeks unfold, uh, as someone who worked very hard and very diligently to impress that set of ethics into your business and those of your colleagues at Frank, this must hurt a lot to watch this. I think it's a disgrace, an absolute disgrace. Many and most, vast majority of the companies are, have a lot of integrity. Some try to be cute, get overly creative and go over the edge. And look what it's done to our, uh, our economy is pretty good, but our market is terrible. Went down again another few hundred points today. And I believe that Beneath all the values that we have is trust, integrity, and the public has lost trust in the, in the market. And uh, it'll come back, but it, like everything else, it's exaggerated and, and uh, people tend to condemn a whole system for a few. That's human nature to do that, and we're experiencing that right now. I was talking to James Stewart, who also was fired oh, yes. this yeah. year with yeah. his, as well as you. And uh, I asked him about this. Uh, this was about the time that, uh, well, this was during the Lincoln weekend. And uh, I said, well, you know, you covered the great stock market crash and all the scandals of the 1980s with the Ivan Bolskis and Michael Milkins and all. We really hadn't had that kind of problem since 1929 when there were so many problems. Why is it we're having this cycle some 15, 20 years later? He said, well, we're just doing more business. We're acting more quickly. The people... Uh, the memory seems to be getting a little bit shorter. Uh, do, you, do you think that this is all going to work itself out and we'll, we'll get back to work? I think it'll work itself out, but in the meantime, we've lost our, our way from an ethical point of view. The push for uh, value in, in stock and in the market, greed and reward, uh, became prominent in everyone's thinking. It was the primary objective to get the stock up and make the money. And I think we, I think we lost our way to some extent. Uh, and it's going to take some time to come back. There's a danger in this too because we are the national, well we're the international leader in business. Uh, the rest of the world still looks to the United States for leadership in these areas. And it's bad enough that it hurts us, but there are some global implications. Oh, this. you bet there is. Serious, serious global implications. And uh, we'll get through it, but it's terribly unfortunate. The, the fraud, dishonest, dishonest, just that simple. And in losing our way, we've lost the trust of the American people. I want to turn to another aspect of your life that's, I'm sure, very intertwined with your work in, uh, in your, corporate, uh, your corporate environment. Uh, many of the executives I've interviewed over the years who have been honored by the Academy feel very deeply that uh, 
not enough to just do well in business, but uh, the company, the community use where your community or your company resides, you have to do community service. The community uh, should prosper from your being there as well, and that seems to be something you you embraced early on in your life. You know, I I do I believe in uh, being involved in the community, using what skills or position you may have to influence others to help the community. And that's re very rewarding. It's rewarding to uh, not only the community but yourself. You feel better about yourself, you feel better about your company when you're involved. Uh, I think one of the things, there's, there's a sacrifice in being involved in the community. There are times when you just as soon come home instead of or prefer to come home instead of being downtown at a business dinner. So there's a sacrifice, but you, you should do that. That's part of the job. Well, you, you've been engaged in uh, a great many of the uh, uh, economic development organizations, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and I believe probably commercial club aspects, right. Like, right. Uh, groups like that. Uh, that's not only good for business, but it's good for the community that business resides in because everyone ends up prospering from that. Right. Uh, if you could speak to that that kind of engagement uh, and forward thinking, uh, I'm sure you, you've probably been following the, the fortunes of the Metropolis 2020 plan. We better have, yeah. yeah. Now there, in, in, there's a study started with the Commercial Club and the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club, which I've been involved in for, for years. And you take what we're doing at O'Hare right now. Uh, it's, a, it's largely, I spent 15 years pushing the O'Hare expansion. Uh, and that's the, that's the biggest economic engine that we have in, this, in the whole state. And it was, it's being thwarted. It's still uh, uh, going forward, but in, in slowly. But uh, people don't realize the impact that that they that that airport has on our economy and on the individual jobs of everyone in the area, everyone in the area. And if you don't expand, if you don't keep up, change will pass you by. And the airplanes can just as well fly over Chicago and go to Denver or someplace else. So we spend a lot of time on that. In the whole metropolis study, the 2020 study, uh, they're looking at uh, Intermodal transportation, which is such a, you know, I was thinking about it driving here. And one of the things that's interesting is that in Chicago, for example, where the, the traffic problems are excessive, the wisdom of our ancestors, our forefathers, built roads on an angle out from the center core, not just the expressways, but all of these angles. Those arterials can be used and speeded up to take traffic off the expressways. That's one of the things in the transportation segment of the Metropolis study that can work. We have to clean up some of the traffic on the side, maybe widen some of those arterials, but that will take a lot of traffic off the expressways. But I, I, I think also uh, in the museum, the, the, the uh, Field Museum, Museum of Science and Industry, those are wonderful cultural uh, aspects of our city. That's why people come here and want to work here. Corporate headquarters will stay here. Lyric Opera, outstanding. The Symphony Orchestra, outstanding. And uh, it's incumbent on the business community and business leaders to be involved in the community for the sake of the company and their employees. You should not overlook that. Well, you're talking about several of the institutions that bring me back here to spend my tourist dollars. Sure, <laughs> sure, exactly. Yeah, um, you've been actively involved with, with with most of those, if not all of those uh, agencies or institutions over the years. I've I've been really pleased to see what's happened at the field under Sandy Boyd and folks yeah. like him. And yeah, so on. that's when I was chairman. I and, understand uh, it. Yeah. Oh, it's what a fantastic institution. Yeah, yeah, it's it's terrific. And that whole museum campus. One of the big efforts we had was to uh, redirect uh, Lakeshore Drive, so that it's all west of the of Soldier Field and the museums and create that museum campus in there. That was a big move to get that 
that we, we spent a lot of time going to get that done because there's a lot of money involved. A lot and of money, uh, a lot of infrastructure, a lot yeah. of property that has to be. And it tied in so nicely with the expansion of McCormick Place too, which is a great asset to the to the to the city and the state. Oh, uh, so I, I feel very strongly about spending time in the community, and I hope our young people would feel the same way. We've got a generation coming along, and they're going to have the same challenges, the same responsibilities, and I, I'm confident they'll step up to it. You see young people today wanting to get involved, and I, I just applaud that. Um, you have worked in one of your volunteer duties uh, directly uh, related to the, the future of young people with your time at Loyola yeah. on the Board of Trustees right. as a member and uh, as uh, chairman of that organization. Right. Um, and I will also talk to you about uh, the, the university hospital system, health system. Yeah. Uh, back to Loyola, your ties there remain very strong to this day. Yes. Um, what, uh, what drew you back to the institution? Uh, it's not just an honorary title to be a member of the board. Oh, no. There's a lot of work. A lot of work. It's a lot of work. I felt that I owed a lot to Loyola because of what it made possible for me to do in those years uh, when I was in, in, in college. Um, it was the values were there, the education was there, the flexibility was there, it was in the city, and you could partake, you could be involved in things in the city. So I just felt as, a, as an institution, it was a, obviously the Jesuits are, are wonderful educators, and uh, uh, it was a f wonderful experience for me. And I, I, I think that it was a very fortunate thing that I was able to, to do at that point in my life. What would, uh, what would you say uh, marked your tenure there at Loyola on the board as far as where you saw the institution heading, and maybe some of the, uh, the some of the impact you were able to have. You never like to measure your own impact. Let other people do that. Really, as far as uh, as I'm concerned, but there are things we weren't able we were able to accomplish. And uh, I think the medical center, without question, is an outstanding institution for clinical treatment and at the high end of clinical treatment. I believe that they still lead in the state in, in uh, uh, heart transplants as the number one. And uh, that's kind of a beacon out there. It, in, it's in Maywood, First Avenue Maywood. And for the western suburbs, they've taken in and put in about 18 primary care and some uh, clinical care facilities out in that area, which has expanded our scope significantly. And as a result, the, the hospital complex at the medical center at the main campus is very, very busy, very busy and doing very well. So that's a, that's a, 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 a part of what, what I, I would hope that I could uh, look back on and feel good about. Yeah. Are, are they? Are they still? Are they? I don't know as much about it. I'll admit as I. As sure. I to. Sure. Do they do uh, a fair amount of teaching there? They? We have the medical school. Mm -hmm, yeah, which is uh, uh, and then about 460 members of that faculty who teach and and are also uh, the, the clinicians. The high-end surgery, uh, large and you know, in um, children's hospital, uh, the heart program is is a large and a good one, and and a cancer institute is uh, a cancer center is fine. So those are things that are building, and they're building now a new uh, uh, outpatient center, because the trend in the in the industry is to get people out of the hospital and do do it on an outpatient basis. And they're building a magnificent new uh, uh, structure out there. You're, you're still involved there. Yes, I'm still chairman still of the chairman. Uh, of the health system. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
what is your vision for for the health system as as we we're already in the 21st century but uh, the next 10 to 15 years down the road where do you see it going I know you, you talked about uh, um, the decentralization and getting out more into the community yes we will continue to reach out into the community and also at the on the main campus it will become more of a a high-end surgical center and surgical and research center uh, and I believe that that's where the investment will go to make it uh, uh, succeed in, in the advanced clinical procedures that uh, are in the offing it, new kinds of heart treatments and new you know there's so much going on in medicine today it's just amazing and uh, a lot of people are living longer as a result. Yeah. Adds immeasurably to the length and the quality of life. Oh, you bet it does, yeah. And they're doing very well. I, it's well managed, and uh, I think that uh, we're, it's one of the very proud parts of, our, of the university. May I ask also, uh, I know that you've been honored by the Republican Party for your work, uh, for your leadership, one of the one of the examples is that is up there. I also I follow politics pretty closely yeah, for yeah. another part of my job, and I saw your name mentioned here not too long ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a, I know corporate executives try to be very careful about how they involve themselves in these things, but obviously you want to put uh, when you see when you find something that you that embraces your value, you want to go and support it. How has your uh, how has your life been working with the Republican Party? I think it's been fine. Uh, I enjoy being involved and for the right candidate. I have supported uh, uh, other candidates, Democratic candidates too, the, the, right, uh, the right people. And uh, many of them are, many of them are friends. Um, but the, the party itself, a lot of good people with good values that I can feel comfortable with. And uh, although my name coming up with that, I never thought that they, you know, I'm surprised it came up. Well, when I saw it, I thought, well, I remember the talk about ethics and uh, yeah. making sure that you were doing everything that you should be and not doing anything that you shouldn't. So I thought, yeah. well, that doesn't surprise me that <laughs> thing came up. Well, yeah. I had a, I was talking with Judy Barthoff. Uh, I won't be using this part of it, but I was talking to Judy. She said, never guess whose name came up. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it came up, to tell the truth. I was just somebody looking to print something. Well, there, unfortunately, at this uh, at this part of the this part of the race, the general assembly has gone home. And you're looking. Right. At, you've got a lot yeah. of political reporters trying to find ways. Yeah, you need you need a story. Yeah. But, uh, I I thought it was a I thought it was a good tribute to you. No, it was nice. Nice than the mission. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering uh, as. Uh, I know you're still busy. You're still working on a lot of different things. Uh, what, what, what are the kinds of activities, the kinds of accomplishments uh, that, that give you the most satisfaction as you look back on them? Oh, from a satisfaction point of view, I, I find it hard to uh, hard to say. I don't take much personal satisfaction in getting something done. If it gets done, that's the satisfaction. It's not within me. Uh, I like to see things accomplished. I, I, I like particularly if, if uh, it's going to be helpful to people. Uh, but I, I, I find it difficult talking about my, my, myself and, and, and getting any satisfaction. But I love to accomplish things, just for the fun of it. And life is very exciting that way. And there's great opportunities and so much to be done, yet to be done. And I think in, in this town, uh, yeah. right, just about, <coughs> I'm just about through, I think. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was gonna, we, were, we were just talking in between tape changes there about how 
how the city of Chicago and the community around it tends to work together very well. Uh, this is sort of a city of millions of people, but it's a small town. Could you speak to that aspect? It is that. It is a small town. It's, the, it's very cohesive. The, the business community is, they're together so frequently on all of the activities of the city. And that's what makes it work. Together with, together with the mayor, who works with the business community very well. And uh, all, I think one of the things that you have to remember, that the, the, the governor, the legislature, the, the, all the government uh, uh, departments have to work well with the business community, and the business community has to work well with them. And if they don't, things don't happen like that, the way they should. So Chicago has, has become known for uh, uh, its uh, cohesiveness. It's also the reason that companies, once they come here, it's hard to get them out. And there are executives whose jobs would change that won't leave the city, and they'll wait for something to develop here, and there's a number of them around, I mean, that just plain like to be here. So it's a good place to raise family. It's, uh, the cultural activities, our are, are, uh, amenities are excellent. So, uh, and the business community feels responsible to be helpful in those areas. I think that's the way to say it. Very good. That's exactly what I was looking for. Um, you have, you've obviously worked with a lot of young people over the years, and you have, you have some thoughts about things that might be helpful for them as they, as they embark on careers. Yes, I do, and I have some feelings. Uh, uh, and let me just sign up, say, I think the priceless ingredients for success for young people, drive, creativity, good judgment, and good interpersonal skills. That combination is what the, and one without the other generally won't work. But you must realize that people have to get along with each other, and they have to know how to get along with each other, but yet the other ingredients are priceless. Add to that integrity, humility, and you go a long way. <laughs> and, and leadership, of course. Yeah. That, that wasn't a very good statement there, I, but I could have. I thought you did very well, but you'd like to make another statement. No, I just think leadership is important. And you can't have a leader that you don't trust. So integrity is a hallmark of, of any young person coming along. Let them build their career on that. And then the other priceless ingredients that I talked about. I don't know whether that well. helps or not. But it's, yes, yeah. it does. Um, I, think we're, I think we're pretty much wrapped up with this okay. sort of things. I need to <coughs> ask you um, um, about... As I said earlier, uh, the folks at Loyola are getting videotape oh, yes, for me yeah. and pictures mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. I was wondering, uh, we spoke a little earlier about uh, 